Hello and welcome uh, to my meeting here with John Butler. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, John Butler is a, he won't like me saying this, but he's a bit of a teacher, uh, a mystic uh, teacher, and he meditates um, uh, in Bakewell in England. And um, he has a, created, a, a, he's found a, a quite a large following uh, of um subscribers on youtube with his channel spiritual unfoldment so uh we're here today because john has uh, dabbled in a bit of poetry uh and for anyone interested in spirituality uh and who likes poetry um then this conversation might be of interest to you so welcome john thank you lee thanks very much um so i think we'd uh start out um by uh, maybe uh, talking about uh, just your beginnings with poetry. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of drew you into talk into writing poetry, and was it just from a young age you were always interested, or or what? Well, I was I was well-taught English at school and um, poetry was part of that. In those days, poetry was expected to have rhythm and rhyme. And uh, I was hardly aware of, of what was then called the new fashion in poetry of writing without rhyme. And uh, after a, I'd been at school some years, I remember the subject arising and the English master teaching us was very scathing about it, said it wasn't proper poetry. Um, well, since then, it's rather taken over, hasn't it? It's quite exceptional now to find any poem that does have rhyme and rhythm. Well, I'd have to sort of be careful of what I say these days, but I was brought up in the old school, you could say. <laughs> and um, rather like with modern music, it's uh, it's got a sort of culture of its own. Mm. Um, sorry, what did you ask me, Lee? I can't, what... No, sorry, yeah, yeah, um, and absolutely. Oh, uh... oh how, how did it start? Well, I think like... Like, like most people who write poetry, it started with unhappy love. And uh, which I think most young men have quite a lot of. And, um, and I think that's what I wrote. Well, I think, no, I, rem I do remember actually at school writing, writing one or two sort of rather um, um, uh, sort of... Um, prescribed poems. Well, of course, I, I was always a countryman and a farmer, and so I wrote about what I loved, which was the country and farming, animals, and um, but uh, I suppose my first ventures into poetry was when I was in my early twenties. Yes, unhappy love. It's a funny thing how poetry arises. It, it I think it's a. It remains a mystery to everyone that writes poetry. It, I don't sure that I actually do write it. It seems to just, it's one of those things that comes into your mind. It, uh, it seems to have a life of its own and, and under certain conditions, it, it, something pops into your mind. And, and if you're, if you're, if you happen to have a pencil and paper handy, you write it down you're often quite surprised and and after a little while you may look at it and read it and maybe change a few words and this and that but the basic impulse comes from well i say in all seriousness god knows where mm. i don't know yes yeah. it pops up um yeah and i i see uh Having read a, uh, a a number of poems in your collections, um, I see you do uh, 
have that that rhythm, that rhyme, the old school rhyme, as you say. And nice. um, uh, you it, it's interesting because uh, you've written quite a large number of books, um, but you do have two collections of poetry, and I, I, they're of of all your books, they're probably the more underrated ones, I think. Um. So you 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 must I, I you must think poetry is important in some way um and I wonder um can poetry sort of act as a as a guide towards a, maybe a higher um plane of uh, say spirit well there's poetry Lee and there's poetry isn't there and um. Uh, so to that rather broad question, I I, 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 I give a very qualified maybe, <laughs> but certainly <laughs> there's a lot of poetry that I wouldn't consider inspiring at all, mm. and is uh, and uh, um, and some uh, a lot depends on on the recipient. Um, on the state of mind or of, of who's reading it, it's. I'm very wary of saying anything um dogmatic about what works and what doesn't work in the, in the spiritual field. We're all different, and uh, and different things resonate with us. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I suppose. Um. For me. Um, the purpose of poetry is uh to try and make you realize something greater than yourself. Um, but obviously you can write a poem about anything. I suppose, uh, it's not good to limit that either. You know, just to to that. But um, well, at it, at its best, and I say that. Uh, with meaning at its best. Poetry does tend to come from we from we don't really know where. And spiritually speaking, this is very important because on our journey to spirit, we don't really know what spirit is. Like we don't know what God is. We don't know what um, space is or silence. See, many things, you could say the real things of life, we don't actually know what they are. We cannot, You, we may have an instinctive feeling towards them. And we, we may uh, have a, a very full emotional appreciation of, for example, beauty. But who can say what beauty actually is? Um, uh, we all talk very easily about love, but who knows what love is? Or freedom, for example, or happiness. Mm. All these things, we, we cannot actually define them. Therefore, poetry that arises from that realm beyond description is indicative that it comes from a higher level of consciousness. Um, perhaps I could just divert a moment and just point out that, that there are many levels of consciousness from sort of subconsciousness or sort of if you like, you use a word like awakeness from being sort of completely asleep or, or unconscious to being asleep to being half awake. Most of us really go through most of the day only half awake, don't we? And then maybe a moment happens and something makes us jump and we suddenly wake up. And uh, and then occasionally something may may really uh, light us up and wow, we sort of move into a yet higher awareness, a sort of super awareness, something that we remember all our lives. 
there are many levels of awakeness or consciousness. And see, things arise from the various levels. And those of us who are interested in spiritual work aspire to, uh, to uh, function more from higher levels of consciousness. And, uh, and indeed, uh, poetry at its best tends to arise from we can't say, which means that it's coming from this higher level of consciousness. It, it's not that it doesn't exist, it exists all too well because we tend to only think that what can be described within this or that exists. But of course, what about the heart, the feelings of the heart, the love, the emotions? Where do, how do they fit in? Of course, they come from a higher level of consciousness. So poetry that arises in this way is... is, is um, is, if you like, spiritually speaking, probably useful, or at least more useful than poetry that arises from a more mundane level of understanding. When you're describing, you know, um, I remember one of my early poems, I described a, 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 an oat cake that, that my wife put in the oven and forgot about. And, it, and of course, it got burnt when he discovered it next morning. And I felt so sorry for this poor little oat cake yeah. that... Uh, that had come and was bought, you know, with a good intention to give give husband something nice for his tea, but got forgotten <laughs> and ended up a cinder. Well, see, that's sort of perhaps rather sweet, but 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 sort of what you might call a worldly poem would bring a smile to many, but perhaps it wouldn't be sort of very spiritually inspiring. Sorry, Lee, I've waffled on a long time to answer that oh, question. Oh yeah, so um... it was you say. Yeah, so so what I took from that was that um there is something spiritual about poetry because it uh <laughs> like you said, the best poetry is written when you're it, as you said, it actually the best poetry you probably wrote was when you yourself you felt as if you hadn't written it, it had come from somewhere else. Exactly. And in doing that, perhaps anyone who was to read it might get something sort of I don't spiritually inspiring as well. So it's kind of a a cycle there or a system of exchange, maybe. Um yes. there's a there's a quote, um, and I think you'll you'll find this one interesting, John, because you often talk about layers of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And um obviously there's you know being present and presence, uh, and the opposite of that is absence, you know, not not being there. But an interesting quote from James Joyce, the Irish writer, uh, who dabbled in poetry himself, uh, a quote from him, he says, absence, the highest form of presence. And I thought that was very interesting because I'm a big fan of yourself and I've watched plenty of your videos and uh, read plenty of your, your, your writings as well. And it seems like a complete contradiction, but something makes me think he said it for a reason, and I'm just trying to understand. Yes, yes, yes I'm sure he did, Lee, because I think in that con, you see, um, <clears throat> I'm talking of <clears throat> we talk of the the presence of God, don't we? The presence of God. Well, um, that may have meaning to some people. Perhaps people, the sort of people that are watching this video perhaps will, will have an idea of what I mean by that. The presence of God. And, uh, and from that, you can be absent, absent from the presence of God, i.e. completely unaware of, of life's spiritual dimension. But, but I suggest James Joyce was probably talking about absence from this world. Well, absence from this world is... is is, is is very likely uh, present with God, and uh, um, and uh, present with God tends to be absence from this world. Um, actually, it's better to be in the world but not of it. Um, you've no need actually to <laughs> separate yourself from this world, but rather but rather just separate your identification with this world. So uh, I suspect he's 
we're talking of two different levels and there's no contradiction really between us. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I I don't know if you have read much of Joyce, but... Uh, Not much, no. No, Um, but his most famous book, Ulysses, um, I think in ways you would like it because uh, it's... Uh, it's set over one day in Dublin in 1904 and it's uh follows this this man as he walks around Dublin and it's amazing because it's an ordinary day nothing at all special really happens but it's the way he captures it um it makes you look at these everyday ordinary things and you appreciate them in a new way you know like for example uh, his character uh, Leopold Bloom walks into a, a a bar and he gets a he eats a cheese sandwich, and um, he describes the cheese sandwich in such detail, like he, he he lavishes attention on this sandwich, and it reminds me of the video. Uh, some of the feet on the ground supporters, uh, or members of your channel might see. Um, there's a video of yourself preparing a cheese sandwich, uh. And I, that's one of my favorite videos that you've put up because it's just sort of a, a meditation in in itself of a simple yes. everyday yes. activity. And uh, yes. he yes. captured that in writing, I think, very well. Um, and it made it made me appreciate making cheese, ham and cheese sandwiches. And, you know, uh, I know that sounds might sound silly to some people that are watching this, but it's uh, there's great satisfaction in everyday things, you know. Indeed, uh, the it, it, and it's a great, um, it's a fundamental principle of of spiritual work, to to uh, to be aware, as you were just describing, um, of of just what's in front of your nose as the day unfolds, and that really is being present, and. Uh, and in comparison, it's perhaps easy for many people watching to understand how seldom we actually pay full attention to what's going on beneath our nose. You know, most of the day we live quite robotically, mechanically, without really being aware at all of what's going on, hardly even aware of the weather, let alone our feet on the ground or uh, or, or listening and looking to what's going on. You've really got to observe people in the street to see almost nobody is actually present. They're yeah. absent. Yeah. Um, I suppose that's why we call it the work, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I saw you recently uh, at a at a meditation retreat in, in Dublin. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate <laughs> to give you a, a copy of my poetry collection. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there was a the, the first poem uh struck you in it, uh, and yeah, I you, I remember you came in and you spoke to me about the, the even the very first line, which mm -hmm. resonated a lot with you, um, and you were actually a big inspiration behind a, a a lot of the poems um in the collection. One is actually dedicated to yourself, uh, morning meditation, but the the first poem, uh, tamed country, um, uh, it it it's uh. It seemed to have sort of an impact on you. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, it is. It did. Uh, the uh, you, you'll always touch my heart. The, 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 anybody that has sympathy for fenced animals, yes. uh, the the, the, uh, the don't fence me in is it, it, it is uh, an old uh, song, an old cowboy song mm -hmm. that I. Uh, I first came across when I was a schoolboy. I think that just about sums up my life. <laughs> and I don't like to see animals fenced in either. Mm. Poor things. Oh dear. That's life, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, um, yes, I like it. It's, that's why this this uh, team, this poem immediately touched my heart, caught my fancy. Yeah. If you'd like to read it, uh so our right. listeners can have a have a hear. <laughs> Well, I'll try, my dear. I'm not sure that I'll, I'll, I'll read it as, as you'd like, but I'll do my oh, best. You, you have a lovely voice, John. Don't worry. I think people will be <laughs> not mine. All right. Well, here goes. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Tamed 
country, which also I like very much as a title. I pity the fenced horses and long for that far away land, that place where there are no roads to lead you home, no names, no signs or town lands to roam. No area of land bound by sounds of the tongue, only trees upon trees, all the squirrel needs, a bridge above soil, between east and west, the crest and its nest. I hear the cries, oh, tame me not, name me not, let me wander unfenced and free, no signs to guide, only my heart to lead. Well, John, I couldn't have done that better now myself. <laughs> that was lovely. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's it's a lovely poem, Lee. I, it's it's uh, full of full of meaning, dear. I uh, <clears throat> I went to visit uh, the Kildare Stud, um, and I saw these great horses, majestic horses, and they were in this paddock. Yes, but they seemed, despite their magnificence, they seemed so. Um, restricted yes and i just thought it was kind of sad it was a great day out it was lovely to walk around and see them and things but i just thought it, that struck me you know and that's what clicked with me to write that and um i thought about how, how this longing for an untamed country uh where like because we have completely tamed the land like they said years ago um i remember hearing before <clears throat> In Ireland, that the Ireland was at one stage so full of trees that a squirrel could run from from mm. the east coast to the west coast without needing to touch the ground. You know, yeah, now yeah. that's not very convenient for us humans to have that uh, a landscape like that, of course. But it's sort of a like it's sort of a I don't know an ideal thing in my in my sort of my dreams to see it. Um, you know, well, well, my dear. I wouldn't dismiss it. I wouldn't be, I, I, if you're going to use a word ideal, I would not use that with any sense of dismissal. You know, it's a very sound instinct that resonates with many, many people. This don't fence me in. And you see, you describe not only the horse, but the fenced in effect of words, names, all these things that take to take the essential spiritual freedom and box it in within a name, within two individuals called John and Lee, in, in different parts, different personalities. Everything's separated and boxed in, whereas the real world is this, it's freedom. It's freedom, my dear. Do we know what freedom is? We only have a sort of gut sense of it when you realize what is not free and you experience this claustrophobia of being fenced in in a world that's too small for us. And, and you know, a lot of people feel this but can't easily put it into words. This, this sense that, that we're trapped in conditions that are too small for us. This longing for the human spirit to get out. We all have this caged eagle within us, wanting to spread its wings, to fly. Mm. And an aeroplane's no good because you're boxing in a silly aeroplane, aren't you? <laughs> the stars, my dear, that's our man's destiny. Look up at the stars. That's about the only place where you can get a sense of it, <laughs> even beyond the stars. 
That's yeah. really that's really our home yeah. in the unfenced spirit, in freedom. Freedom beyond words and concepts and uh, and all the boxed in effects of what we think of as life, which isn't really life at all. It is exile from our true home, which is spirit. And then of course, in our in our in our fall from this, we've fenced in all the animals as well, haven't we? <laughs> you know, got nature all boxed in. It's all cursed with this with this disease of man, mm -hmm. this this uh, separation, yeah. um, this this craving to box everything in, give it names and describe it and make it. And so we end up with more and more of less and less. It's this basic dissatisfaction of man, longing for the stars and, and having to make do with, you know, with the baubles of this world. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> like uh, when you think <clears throat> of, um, say, like, obviously, we've, like you said, we give names to things, even like, say, the animals, like we call the animal, like, say, a sheep. Yes. But of course, like, given enough time, um, that sheep will have, will uh evolve, in and in say in a million years time, that sheep could be very different to what we see now, um, and would it be something else then? Do, would it deserve a new name? Would it still be a sheep? You know, so it just shows the sort of the fruitlessness of language as well, um. In one sense, you know, uh. But um, yeah. I don't know. Um, I a, a notification just came up there to tell me I've got ten minutes left in this meeting, um. So we can keep going for a bit, but uh, if you'd like, we can start a new meeting, John, and we can uh continue. But we'll see how we, how we how we go. Um. Well, uh, or shall I read the next poem? Oh yes, yeah. Uh, this poem, yeah, it's dedicated to yourself. Um. After my, I, I visited Bakewell in um, twenty nineteen, and it was such a profound uh, experience. Um, uh, it, yeah, it'd be lovely to hear you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, this one is called Morning Meditation, and it was obviously written in winter time. It would have been mm. October. Yeah, October was when I went. October was it. Mm. <clears throat> In Bakewell, when the sky is blue-black, when all is quiet, cross over the road to the church. Move with purpose with a blanket under arm, as the church is cold. Be quick to sit with feet on the floor, with your bottom on the chair. Be still, and know God, and move out without form, melt away from this place, this world forlorn, brush over all you know with this ethereal paint, realize that the worst sinners were the greatest saints. Thank you for that, John. Um, yeah, um, I had to write a poem. I felt very compelled to do that after uh, I visited you. Um, and uh, 
I'm glad I did because uh, I don't think I, I'd, um, while I re uh, remember it quite well, I, I don't think I'd be able to reproduce what I, I wrote that shortly after I'd gone and I don't think I'd be able to reproduce that the same sort of intent with the same intensity, you know? Um, yes. But, um, I, yeah. I do know, Lee, it, it, this again is a feature of, of what I'll call real writing is that it arises from the moment because we come back to what we're saying about being absent and present. You see, the presence of God is always here and now, now. And that's why true inspiration arises in the moment. And if you try to remember to write down later on, well, first of all, you won't remember it. Because this is, you'll forget it before you, before you got, got home for breakfast. I bet your boots you'd have forgotten it. And if you try to, to botch it together from what you remember, it won't be the same. But if you write it, if you carry a notebook with you and write it down there and then, something of that, of that uniqueness of unfenced words will, will be conveyed. Yeah. And they are unique. It's just like, you know, every sudden every sunrise, every morning is different. The sky is never the same. And so it is with true inspiration. It it is completely unique for that moment. Extraordinary, um, but that's what it is. I think uh, I remember you saying in one of your videos that you were so glad in your younger years to have kept a notebook and recorded yeah. your your experiences and feelings. Yes. And, yeah. And, and and may I also point out, because you see, what you were talking about earlier from that first poem, this uh, this craving of the human heart for freedom and, and its, you know, its um, frustration with the conditions of life that, that fence in the animals as well as ourselves. Um, those that uh, discover meditation find a wonderful way of of discovering the spiritual reality of freedom. It, it, it's it's not that we leave this world, but we open up, as it were, another dimension, another high, dimension of higher consciousness, which enables us to access and have real experience of of, uh, as you put it here, moving out beyond form, beyond this this form, you see, moving out beyond body, beyond the form of thoughts, moving out beyond name and form into the nameless and formless, which is actually spirit. That, well, that's what it did feel like. Um, <clears throat> um, and I think uh, that was, I remember it was the second day uh, in particular, um, that I was meditating with you in Bakewell, that I I really felt, and I think it's it's an it's kind of a it's a it's a real uh, it's a strange one because I really enjoyed it, and it was I don't think I wasn't expecting it, and I think because of that, I've been chasing that sort of ever since. But I know what you say, I, I, you say to there should be no expectation, um, and I know that on a sort of an intellectual level. But I suppose practice will help me overcome that completely. Um, but practice, um, practice, practice, yes, yeah, practice makes perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we only have two minutes left. Uh, well, so. I, th I think we've had a very good conversation, and uh, maybe that's enough. Mm -hmm. I I think so. I just I'd, I'd I'd like to just finish with one one more thing from Patrick Kavanagh. For the last two minutes it's called uh having confessed uh, and he says uh he, the irish poet patrick cabana and he writes having confessed he feels that he should go down on his knees and pray for forgiveness for his pride for having dared to view his soul from the outside lie at the heart of the emotion time has its own work to do 
we must not anticipate or awaken for a moment. God cannot catch us unless we stay in the unconscious room of our hearts. We must be nothing, nothing that God may make us something. We must not touch the immortal material. We must not daydream tomorrow's judgment. God must be allowed to surprise, surprise us. We have sinned, sinned like Lucifer by this anticipation. Let us lie down again, deep in anonymous humility, and God may find us worthy material for his hand. Amen. Amen. John, we've less than a minute, so I'm going to say thank you for joining me today. And uh, anyone watching, please do check out John's channel, Spiritual Unfoldment. I'll put a link in the description. And thank you once again, John. Thank you, Lee. I've enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very you. much. Keep writing poetry. When it comes, Lee. Only when, when it, it comes. When it comes. Thank you, John. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.